Welcome to Washington, D.C. I'm James Foster, the co-director of the Institute for International Economic Policy, or IIEP as we call it, here in the Elliott School of International Affairs at the George Washington University. Thank you all for being here today for a conversation with Dr. Simon Zadik on sustainability and the architecture of global finance. The event is in the second in our Rethinking Capitalism and Democracy series and is co-sponsored by the Thunderbird School of Global Management at Arizona State University as part of its series on finance and sustainability. In just a moment, I'll invite the co-organizers of today's event, Dr. Sunil Sharma of the Elliott School and Dr. Anne Florini of Thunderbird to set the stage and introduce our distinguished guests and discussants. But first, just a few words about the Elliott School and our institute. As the largest school of international affairs, the top-ranked Elliott School has a remarkable location, a quick stroll from the World Bank, the Treasury, the Fed, and the Fund. IAP is a research institute within the Elliott School where scholars and policymakers present and discuss the newest findings on such topics as global governance, climate change, ultra-poverty, and China's ascendance. Our China Conference webinar series began recently with a keynote address by World Bank Chief Economist Carmen Reinhardt on China's loans to the world. Our Facing Inequality webinar series began last summer with Branko Milanovic discussing his newest results on global inequality. And our Envisioning India series will meet again December 9th with Pranab Bardhan and discussions Michael Walden, Walton, and Jean Drez for a conversation on capitalists in India. If you miss an IAP event, check out our YouTube channel at IIEPGW. I now welcome the co-organizers of today's event to the virtual podium. Anne Florini is clinical professor at the Thunderbird School of Global Management, Arizona State University, where she directs programs at the Washington DC campus. Sunil Sharma joined IAP as a distinguished scholar after 25 years at the International Monetary Fund. Coincidentally, both were in Singapore before returning to DC. Sunil will moderate today's session and Anne will start us off with a few introductory comments. Anne. Thank you very much, James, and welcome to everybody on behalf of the Thunderbird School of Global Management, which is retaining its number one ranking in global management for the world, and on behalf of Arizona State University, which is ranked first in the country on innovation and has been for many years. And I think those factors are important because they explain why it is that on the ASU side, we are so interested in the combination of finance and sustainability. ASU has what has to be the world's largest school of sustainability with hundreds of faculty involved. So our focus on thinking through the connections between finance and sustainability is fundamental to the mission of ASU and to the mission of Thunderbird. I also want to provide a special welcome to those students who are in our Washington DC based program, where I am based, our Executive Master of Arts in Global Affairs and Management, where our first cohort is about to finish up with their final intensive course. And you will all remember today's key speaker, Simon Zadek, from his scintillating presentation in our course a couple of months ago. I also want to welcome the prospective students and recently admitted students who are going to be joining us in the mid-career master's program starting in January. And you will see that these are the kinds of topics that we think are absolutely fundamental to understanding management education for the future. So welcome to all on behalf of an ASU, and let me turn it over to Sunil. Oh, hello, everybody. Let me add my welcome to James and Anne. Um, I'm going to say a few words about um, our Rethinking Capitalism and Democracy series, um, and then um, I will make a few remarks to set the stage and then introduce our distinguished speaker and discussants. The COVID-19 pandemic, like the global financial crisis a decade ago, has laid bare the cracks in the leading capitalist democracies. The challenge the challenges are many, polarized societies and a lack of social trust, inadequate health and social security systems, high debt among financial and non-financial institutions, households and governments, income and wealth inequality, deficiencies in corporate governance, weak government oversight and regulation, 
and destruction of uh, the environment. The three spheres of well-being, political and social, economic and financial, and the natural environment are each becoming more fragile while their complex interactions are producing some very wicked challenges. The IIEP webinar series on rethinking capitalism and democracy examines these difficult questions and possible policy responses. And the critical questions cut across disciplines. In last month's seminar, Valuing Nature, Whales, Elephants, and the Global Economy, Ralph Shami and Connell Fullenkamp presented a novel science-based valuation framework for pricing nature services. They offer the examples of whales and elephants in carbon sequestration. Importantly, whales and elephants provide such services only in the context of the ecosystems in which they are embedded. And we should be thinking about the preservation and valuation, not just of individual keystone species, but the ecosystems they inhabit. Today's seminar, Sustainability and the Architecture of Global Finance, we will look at the broader environmental sustainability agenda and the ways in which the architecture of global finance is changing under growing pressures to take environmental and social issues seriously in financial decision making. Simon Zadek will lead the discussion and we will be joined by Anne Florini and Sonia Gibbs as discussants. Let me provide some context with a few brief remarks. As a recent essay in Current Biology points out, there are similarities among the COVID-19 pandemic, the climate crisis, and the extinction of species. First, human impacts on planet Earth, like the COVID-19 pandemic, are phenomena characterized by positive feedback effects. Global warming can trigger state shifts in ecosystems, which further increase net emissions. Ecological interdependencies and interacting threats accelerate the extinction of species and destroys the ecosystem services on which we all depend. There are significant time lags in each of these problems. COVID-19, between infection and presentation of symptoms, removal or destruction of habitat and the prolonged extinction of species, between greenhouse gas emissions and the effects of thermal expansion and ice sheet melting on sea level rise. And the dynamics of these phenomena are complex, nonlinear, and well understood with momentum effects and tipping points. Second, no substitute for early action. As the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has shown, early control actions and COVID-related mort mort mortality are related. Delaying action on climate could expose hundreds of millions of the poorest in the world to multi-sector climate risks. Species conservation is less likely to succeed the longer actions are delayed. Third, effective and acceptable interventions require decision makers and citizens to act in the interests of society as a whole and in the interests of future generations. More generally, viruses, circulating uh, gas house emissions, circulating greenhouse ga uh, gas emissions and threats to natural environment are not localized within boundaries and hence require international coordination and cooperation and self-organized action by a wide range of societal actors. Even in purely financial terms, delayed action reduces prosperity as well as costs lives as we have seen during the pandemic. Paying short-term costs in responding to climate and extinction crises may secure long-term prosperity. Yesterday, in the Financial Times, the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres was quoted as saying that making peace with nature is the defining task of the 21st century. It must be the top, top priority of everyone everywhere. So our ability to make a timely peace with nature is one of the great poly policy questions of our time, if not the policy question of our time. It is imperative to understand the scientific consensus, consensus as it evolves, because it will be central to dealing with the economics, the politics, and the sociology of our reactions. So with that, let me introduce um, our speaker and discussants. Simon Zadek is chair of the Finance for Biodiversity Initiative and director of the Migrant Nation Initiative. Until recently, he headed the Secretariat of UN Secretary General's Task Force on Digital Financing of the SDGs. Previously, he was Senior Advisor on Finance in the Executive Office of the Secretary General 
and co-director of the United Nations Environmental Program Inquiry into the Design of a Sustainable Financial System. In these roles, he co-chaired China's Green Finance Task Force and led the Green Finance Study Group Secretariat under the Chinese, German, and Argentinian G20 presidencies. Sonia Gibbs is the Managing Director and Head of Sustainable Finance at the Institute for International Finance. She leads the IIF's work on sustainable finance and sovereign debt policy, focusing on, reach, on research advocacy for the Institute's global membership across the financial services industry. Her policy work on behalf of IIF includes advocacy and liaison efforts vis-a-vis -vis the G20, the multilaterals, global regulators and standard setters, and the central banks and supervisors network for greening the financial system. Sonia's work is widely cited in the financial press, and she is a regular speaker at industry conferences and in the media. She also hosts the popular series of IIF climate finance workshops and ESG seminars. Anne Florini uh, is a clinical professor at the Thunderbird School of Global Management at Arizona State University, where she directs the programs in Washington, D.C. She was previously professor of public policy at Singapore Management University, founding director of the Center on Asia and Globalization at the National University of Singapore, and a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. She has spearheaded numerous international initiatives on global governance, energy and climate policy, cross-sector collaborations involving government, civil society, and the private sector. Her many books and articles have addressed governance in China, transparency in governance, transnational civil society networks, and the role of the private sector in public affairs. With that, let me hand over the mic to Simon. Um, Simon, yeah, you have 30 to 40 minutes uh, to make the presentation. Welcome, Simon. So thank you very much, Sunil, and also um, uh, for those of you who don't know Sunil and Anne, when you get the call from them, um, demanding uh, one's presence, one uh, takes it very seriously. Uh, and so I've tried to put together um, a deck um, and uh, some comments to go along with the deck <laughs> that uh, certainly uh, forced me to think about the subject that I have been allotted. Um, and uh, I'm not really sure whether I have uh, particular insights into the answer to what is uh, an extraordinarily important domain the nexus between global finance and sustainability. But let's take us through uh, a few slides and see kind of where we uh, get to. So um, since this is in part within a university context, I'm going to ask you all to pick up your virtual pens because I'm going to begin with a quiz. Um, and uh, I'll lay out uh, the questions uh, reasonably uh, quickly. So which company released the world's first externally audited sustainability report and when, and how many sustainability reports are being produced now? When was the first green use of proceeds bond issued, uh, and by whom, and what is the current value of green bond issuance today? Uh, which country launched the world's first national strategy for embedding green finance across its financial and capital markets, and when? What is the dollar value of possible financial asset losses if the 1.5 degree warming limit in the Paris Agreement goal is actually reached? <clears throat> Precision is not required in that particular one. Uh, what is the dollar value uh, of capital market assets that are subject to some kind of sustainability screen? Uh, and finally, at least in this first quiz, how many central banks worldwide are actively advancing climate in their core activities and which central bank is the latest to join the club. And, and so uh, I'm not going to keep you in suspense because I am going to first run through a set of answers because I think the answers tell us a lot. So, so on the first, um, The Body Shop was the first publicly listed company in 1995 to produce the first externally audited sustainability report. But if you look at today, um, the most recent uh, analysis suggests that somewhat 90% of the S&P 500, in fact, produce a sustainability report. I'm sure to all sorts of different standards, but an extraordinary development when you think about it. Similarly, uh, the Swedish bank SEB, together with the World Bank, was uh, alleged, at least, to be the first couple to issue a green bond in 2008. 
Uh, the numbers keep changing on the current total value of issuance, but it hovers in most estimates around $1 trillion. Still a very small percentage of the overall global bond market, but a rapidly growing segment. Uh, which country launched the first really green national finance game plan? Um, actually, it's China. At a state council meeting on the 30th of October 2016, in fact, uh, chaired by the president himself, China adopted the 13-part plan to green its financial system. This was obviously done in the context of its presidency of the G20. Actually, today, you will not find a G20 member that does not have some kind of national green finance plan. Uh, varying qualities, but nevertheless an extraordinary development over a very short period of time. <clears throat> Standard assets is sort of one of those terms of the era, uh, and the estimates vary uh, when it comes to carbon-related stranding. Um, but uh, certainly one estimate by the FT and some of their colleagues comes out at around a trillion dollars, uh, if that 1.5 degree uh, goal is achieved. Uh, and then there are a whole other set of estimates uh, that really connect not only to climate and carbon, but also to that broader dependency on nature. Uh, WEF estimates 44 trillion, half of global GDP is dependent on nature, much of which is in a vulnerable condition. Um, again, on total screened, uh, um, market capital flows, estimates vary, uh, but many of them sort of hover somewhere in the $30 trillion uh, level. Again, still a small segment of what most would say is about $185 trillion worth of financial assets in capital markets, but nevertheless an extraordinarily large number given that we all thought originally that this was a sort of niche affair. And then finally, you know, in 2014, there wasn't a single central bank on the planet that really knew anything about climate at all. Uh, and today, the network of central banks on greening the financial system, already mentioned in the context of Sonia Gibbs, has 77 members across five continents, 77 central banks. And yes, indeed, the US Federal Reserve is the latest to want to join that network and begin pushing on the climate agenda as it relates to the Fed's own mandate. So, so really what we see from that quiz and the very short answers is that stuff is on the move. Uh, there's an enormous amount going on and we've got to try to understand why. And I don't mean why in terms of saving the planet. I mean, why are we looking at the financial system rather than uh, looking exclusively, as some would argue, at the real economy? And I've sort of tried to map four simple uh, reasons for that. Risk management systems in the financial system not really working, so an enormous amount of work going on around how to factor climate and nature and other aspects of sustainability into the way in which risk management works. You know, upgrading standards and incentives, new markets, new instruments, that whole sort of promoting innovation space across global finance. Uh, really building out to the financial stability level, hence the involvement of central banks and financial regulators. You know, how can we really understand what some of these broader nature and climate effects in particular effect are on financial system stability? And then perhaps a more contentious area, but one that is very much at the bleeding edge of the discussion about the links between financial regulation, monetary policy, uh, and also real economy policy, if you like, like climate policy, industrial policy, and so on, is where, where, how really do we need to understand the coherence or the alignment or the equivalence between what central banks do and, for example, you know, carbon targets or climate targets uh, that are being adopted by the governments of the countries in which those central banks are inhabited. So, so these are some of the reasons why we're looking at finance as well as, of course, thinking about global carbon prices and many other rules and regulations and innovations within what we might call the real economy. And so what I hope the quiz tells you is that this stuff is happening everywhere. This is actually quite an old slide, and one could add many, many layers of this slide with many other countries with an enormous amount going on, both at the market level, uh, at the policy level, uh, and at the regulatory level in a whole range of 
uh, of different ways. So this is a tiny fragment of examples of the extraordinary range of activities, all of which are not necessarily about climate, not necessarily about nature, sometimes about inequality, sometimes about health and education, financial inclusion, but all of which are about how to shape the financial system in ways that align financial flows with the sustainable development goals in some shape or other. Uh, and effectively, we have these two different sets of activities going on. We have what we might call mainstream reforms, improved metrics, improved stress testing, you know, more stringent reporting requirements on stock exchanges around the world, adjustments and reinterpretations of fiduciary responsibility, prudential regulation, obviously within the central banking regulatory space. These are what one might call an emerging range of incremental but really important changes that are happening within the core of the way in which financial markets are overseen and governed. And then you have an awful lot of other stuff going on around the edges, if you like, that are more innovative, more testing, more piloting, more experimenting, more challenging, more disruptive, some of which over time sort of flow into the core. So certainly five years ago, we would have looked at the work of Carbon Tracker that effectively invented our discourse on stranded assets and seen it as very much outside of the mainstream. And today we see it absolutely at the core of the mainstream debate at the nexus between climate risk, financial stability, uh, and uh, climate itself more broadly. Uh, and so this mixture of niche and avant-garde blending gradually as we go, um, uh, delivering extraordinary levels of change um, across different aspects of global finance. And I guess that sort of brings me inevitably, you know, having started with an upside story to the sort of yes, 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 we're making a difference, but well, are we really making enough difference for this stuff to count in the way that it needs to? And so I want to spend kind of the second part of my presentation uh, really sort of reflecting on the question of what does it mean to move beyond making a difference? What does it mean to begin thinking about what actions we need to take um, that would have some sort of systemic effect on the way finance really functions? Think of the many different factors that influence how global financial and capital markets evolve, including, of course, public finance that is interlaced into private financial and capital markets. You know, the way in which one leverages public finance, different methods, tools and standards, changing public policy and opinion, obviously incredibly important, national development plans in the climate space, linking increasingly across into the financial market development space. And of course, disruptions that in principle have nothing per se to do with the SDGs, but may make an awful lot of difference to the way in which we align finance to SDG outcomes, notably the way in which digitalization is changing much of uh, the world around us as we understand global finance. So our question becomes not how can we do something that's interesting or useful or makes a difference, but how do we understand this complex system that we call global finance and make decisions on what the right levels of intervention are? Now, Sunil mentioned the last session that we had, um, which was focused on Ralph Charmy's presentation um, about uh, the possibilities of, if you like, monetizing, financializing uh, in a range of different ways, you know, whales and elephants because of their sequestration, uh, sequestration opportunities. Um, but really, part of what lay at the core uh, of that story was the issue of legal personhood for nature. You know, do we believe that actually it is a systemic change parameter if we bring a stronger sort of rights of nature into the way in which we think about uh, nature protection and climate management going forward? Hard to tell, very much a niche today. Um, or to take a second example, really coming back to the digital story, you know, do we really believe, as, for example, this slide would suggest, the quote from Maria Ramos, uh, the ex-CEO of ABSA Bank in South Africa, do we really believe that the key to digitalization is that it gives greater control to citizens individually around the world, as well as collectively, greater control over the use of the world's financial assets, which ultimately, of course, 
are theirs in a whole range of different ways. Is this really the point of leverage that we need to think about in reshaping finance going forward? You know, often these are very upside opportunities, perhaps inspiring with many interesting examples, but as the, uh, uh, the additional sort of news clip highlights, many of them come with unintended consequences or with complications that can detach finance from our broader sustainability ambitions as easily as it can attach them and advance them positively. How do we understand tipping points? This is a tipping point I attended. This was in Lima, in Peru. It was the IMF annual meetings. In 2015, I'd been running a commission on financial markets and sustainable development. We'd reached a point where this was to be launched, and this was our panel. Achim Steiner on uh, the right, as you look at it, was sort of the moderator and at that time ran UNEP. And then Mark Carney, uh, Mr. Rahman, uh, and uh, of course, Mr. Uh, Yi Gang, who is now the governor of the People's Bank of China. And in presenting this report, discussing the nexus between sustainability uh, and financial markets, Yi Gang yeah, quite unexpectedly announced um, really, uh, to everyone's surprise, that China planned to take green finance to the G20 during its presidency in 2016. The, the room was full. You could hear a pin drop. There were a series of notable gasps. And the game was on. And that's exactly what they did with many, many cascade implications for the way in which we have built green finance plans, policies, engaged central banks, and of course, moved in markets themselves uh, as a result. So what are the tipping points that really move us on at a systemic level, which is the level of intervention that we need to think about and act around? Here's another possible piece of the story. So in the context of the pandemic mentioned by Sunil already, you know, there has been an extraordinary tsunami of announcements of public financing to stimulate, indeed, if not save, many economies from imploding. The numbers vary. There's something between 11 and $13 trillion, the largest outpouring of public finance in peacetime in the history of civilization. I feel very comfortable in kind of saying that with ease. So this is a map that Finance for Biodiversity, which I chair, has done looking at what the nature content of those stimulus programs really look like. And basically, red is bad and green is good. And what you see very quickly is with one or two exceptions, uh, really the stimulus programs across the world uh, are either going to have neutral or negative effects on climate and nature in at least the terms that they have been announced and in many cases spent out. So really an extraordinary opportunity to shape a massive wave of, wave of public finance in favor of that planetary ambition with all of these societal benefits that go with it. Uh, and frankly, uh, an opportunity that with one or two exceptions looks to have been squandered. Of course, in the recovery process that may improve, uh, but this was a place of intervention where a major systemic change could have been made. Another example, again, an area in which finance for biodiversity is working in the context of what is likely to be an extensive, highly correlated sovereign debt crisis, certainly for many, many emerging markets. And that's something perhaps Sonia will speak to as well, given the specialization of IIF in this area. And so finance for biodiversity, along with a coalition uh, of different partners ranging from the World Bank to hedge funds and others, you know, are asking the question, is this crisis an opportunity to do what we all know should be done, which is that sovereign debt markets should really carry balance sheets? Why would one invest in a corporation without a balance sheet? Why would one invest in a country without a balance sheet? And clearly natural capital is a key piece and a growing and an increasingly important piece of what needs to sit in sovereign debt markets. Could we use the opportunity of the crisis uh, 
very much as Hank Paulson, the quote at the bottom indicates, to bring nature and climate more explicitly into the way in which sovereign debt is priced uh, and in which sovereign debt markets work in practice. Moving on, um, uh, I was introduced as uh, having spent much of the last two years uh, chairing uh, on behalf of the UN Secretary General what actually has turned out to be a fantastic task force focused really on the question of how to harness the fact that digitalization is disrupting and transforming financial and capital markets as well as public finance. How can one harness that disruptive process uh, in aligning those financial flows more effectively with sustainable development outcomes? Probably the greatest disruption to financial markets that we've seen certainly in our lifetime, even more so than, for example, the great financial crisis. It was a fantastic task force. I'm not going to introduce you to the 17 members, but hopefully you can see some of the folks kind of peeking out from their pictures and titles and see really the quality of the team that was in place. Two years down the line, that work has now been completed and published, and there are various tracks that are extending from it, one or two of which I will mention in a second. But at the heart of it are five catalytic opportunities. These are multi trillion dollar opportunities that we feel if there are significant efforts made to uh, harness these opportunities, it doesn't only bring numbers differently channeled towards sustainable development outcomes, but also has, as the name suggests, catalytic effects in the way in which it reshapes financial and capital markets going forward. Opportunities, one of which I'm going to dive into in a little bit more detail in a second, span moving domestic savings more directly into long-term development finance, ramping up through the use of algorithmic lending and other aspects of digitalization financing for small and medium-sized businesses, the largest employers in the world by a long margin, moving towards a radical transparency and accountability of public financing, making use of digitalization to make that possible and effective. Uh, moving from that $30 trillion I talked about a little bit earlier uh, to really cover embedding SDGs much more broadly in the way in which capital markets make financing decisions. And ultimately, although it's often not included in the way in which we talk about finance, consumer expenditure and clearly digitalization opens a whole range of new opportunities to influence the way in which consumers uh, make individual purchasing decisions, taking broader issues into account. Just one, really, of those uh, five Catholic opportunities, I just can't avoid, in a way, giving an example of. And, and I'm going to take the case of Bangladesh, because during the course um, of the task force, we had extensive engagement through the Prime Minister's Office of Bangladesh in examining this opportunity. The development paradigm, one, one could almost put it, um, over the last half a century has been that developing countries should focus principally on tapping international capital markets to finance their long-term development. And where concessionary finance is available through DFIs or grants or aid in other ways, that can obviously reduce the cost of capital in a number of ways. And I would be so bold, and I'm sure um, somewhat oversimplistic to argue that there are few countries that can demonstrate that this approach has been successful. And many countries that can demonstrate that uh, the more effective use of domestic resources uh, has really been a driver of building out infrastructure and other critical pieces of um, the development agenda. What we looked at uh, in relation to that first catalytic example was the implications of mobilizing micro savings in Bangladesh, which have increased enormously over the last 20 years um, through mobile devices, channeling them into a new suite of financial instruments that could function despite weaknesses in capital markets and capital market regulations in Bangladesh, as they are in many developing countries, and then to use blockchain and a number of other means in order to increase the transparency and effective deployment of those funds into development infrastructure, schools, bridges, roads, and so on. Um, what we looked at 
at a macro level uh, was the potential savings that that could bring to Bangladesh uh, in terms of the cost of capital, uh, the equity and distributional and multiplier effects that it would bring because it would effectively mean that the investors that were being paid a dividend were micro savers across Bangladesh instead of JP Morgan or other organizations outside of the country. Uh, and also the trigger effects that that might have in terms of catalyzing um, uh, domestic capital markets themselves. So rather than this simply disintermediating existing actors and creating sort of channel pathways, uh, if you like, uh, certainly from the government point of view, their interest was the way in which this might, in fact, catalyze um, domestic bond markets more effectively. Um, the point of the example, without sort of belaboring it, uh, is to try and illustrate that um, relatively small digital innovations placed effectively within existing financial and capital markets um, are not simply a way of producing one new financial instrument or funding things that people say are SDG aligned, but can have catalytic effects in the way in which finance as a whole uh, functions in critical aspects of its intermediation operations, notably channeling domestic savings to long-term finance. Couple more systemic opportunities, really just to sort of belabor the point. So, so this is really a different part of the world of fintech. And it's an example I just for, again wanted to spend a couple of minutes on. Um, the Ant Group, uh, the world's largest sort of pure play fintech or f a digital platform for finance, obviously Chinese. Now, I guess, Sunil, you would have the numbers better than me, about one and a half billion users, both in domestic China and through joint ventures in other countries. Um, back in 2016, whilst I was still working at UNEP, um, developed and launched with our support uh, an app on what is effectively the Alipay platform that meant that every time you spent some money buying something, getting in a car, driving a taxi and so on, um, some simple algorithms delivered back a view as to whether or not you were exceeding your carbon wallet uh, benchmarked across uh, the population um, or whether you were effectively saving or avoiding carbon that if you had spent otherwise you would uh, have used. Uh, that was then turned into a sort of green energy point system, gamified across social media platforms, uh, and then also drove um, uh, as an additional benefit as one collected green energy points, um, an offset, a tree planting offset program in Inner Mongolia. We expected 1 million people at maximum to play this game. Uh, and we discovered over a period of three years that far from it being 1 million, uh, it has actually turned into the world's largest carbon market free of policy and free of price, purely constructed out of a sense of identity with the issue. So a completely different way of thinking about carbon markets, 550 million people regularly, that is every day using this app with very little signs of a kind of tail off of interest, uh, despite the fact that now this has been going on since the middle of 2016. Very different way of thinking about fintech, a very different way of thinking about disruption and innovation, a very different way of thinking about how to shape citizen behavior in this case uh, as consumers. But of course, one could equally imagine a similar approach being taken uh, for, for citizens as investors, uh, for citizens as pension policy holders, for citizens as taxpayers, and so on. A very large scale opportunity. And I think the Ant Forest points us uh, the way we can go uh, elsewhere. I wanted, and perhaps this sort of brings me to the kind of tail end, uh, Sunil, of my presentation. I, I wanted to end by going, in amidst all of these innovative opportunities, we need to think about governance as well. Um, and governance requires us to be as innovative um, as we are in markets, uh, uh, in technology development, uh, and so on. Uh, and if you like, the emergence of a generation 
of big fintech platforms illustrates, it's certainly not a comprehensive view, but illustrates uh, the ways in which we need to think differently. Uh, you all heard about the case of Libra, uh, Facebook's digital currency, which may or may not play out. You'll have noticed that Ant, just referred to now, is running into its own regulatory problems in China. China's also about to launch its own global digital currency through, uh, 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 through its central bank. Alipay could now, in the next two or three years, account for a significant portion of global card payments. We're seeing a generation of digitally enabled global giants, if you like, in the financial space that have cross-border effects into particularly smaller, weaker developing countries, but also larger developed countries. And we need to think about how this can be governed. Uh, and I think the innovation space again here is relatively clear. If you follow the Libra case, what you'll see, whatever you think about Facebook or Libra or digital or stable coins or any of that paraphernalia, what is clear is that there are very few actors, regulators really involved in making decisions as to whether Libra will continue or not. And likewise, for these other major platforms. Not only that, but these regulators are largely concentrated in the world's most powerful markets and countries, Europe, UK, US, you know, perhaps one or two others. And they are in the main central banks and financial regulators concerned quite rightly uh, with competition policy, concerned with financial stability, concerned with money laundering, but not really concerned with broader sustainable development outcomes. We need to think differently about governance and we need to think differently about financial governance and we need to connect the dots between this emerging new set of actors that will become significant players in the global financial economy going forward and the ways in which we want them to be regulated to ensure that they align their business practices, their product development, their pricing mechanisms with broader sustainable development outcomes. As part of the task force, uh, we've launched a, a dialogue on inclusive digital financial governance co-chaired by the central bank, uh, the governor of the central bank of Kenya involving many other developing country actors trying to figure how does one bring other actors into that regulatory or governance agenda and how does one broaden that agenda into a broader sustainable development landscape. In conclusion, perhaps just sort of uh, some reflections that try to sort of draw it together by asking you to consider um, whether you would agree with what six, I think, uh, important individuals running important institutions that have taken important positions on what I have just reviewed have taken. I'm not going to go through each of these in detail, but, but the story effectively goes like this. Piyush Gupta from DBS, sustainable development is really about the markets that I'm facing in the future. If I set aside sustainable development or see it as a niche, or a program or an initiative, then I'm not really understanding what future possibilities there are for the bank that I have responsibility for running. Mark Carney, by far, you know, not a, a sort of radical activist taking a view when he was still governor of the Bank of England. If we want to take sustainable development into account, you know, and he uses the language, the financial sector requires a fundamental reset. This is not a minor adjustment that Mark has been talking about. Mir Maria Ramos really talking about that whole um, empowerment agenda. Do we really believe that citizens can be empowered to take greater control over the money that is ultimately theirs? Or has finance really just unlocked itself and moved in a completely different direction? Eric Ying, similarly, executive chair of the Ant Group. You know, do we really believe in this digital story? Yeah, you know, I told a couple of extraordinary examples which really illustrate the potential. Yeah, but I also highlighted that high frequency trading and other factors and aspects of digitalization can be as much part of a problem as part of a solution. I wonder how many governors of central banks would say the same thing as Patrick and Jaroge. Uh, 
my job, he said, and he meant it very seriously, and he was definitely not off the job when he made the statement. My real job is to democratize finance. And then he spent a lot of time explaining why that was not simply a simple sort of statement sitting on the back of a car, but really at the core of how he understood his job. And finally, Kristalina Georgieva, Managing Director, IMF, of course, to return the financial services industry to what is it supposed to be, an industry that serves people. You know, the core, really, of all of the points that I've tried to make over the course of these remarks. So with that, if I may, Sunil, I will pass back to you. I hope I've kept broadly to time uh, and that I've broadly covered what you and Anne were hoping that I would touch on. Thank you very much. Uh, Simon, thank you very much for uh, a very nice presentation um, and some very nice slides. Um, we'll make the deck available um, in PDF form uh, when we post the, the, the video. Um, what I want to say now is that um, uh, let's have the discussions um, have 10 minutes um, and we'll start with, so uh, we'll start with Anne, um, followed by Sonia, and then um, we'll try and open the discussion after that. Uh, so Anne, uh, please. Uh, the floor is yours. So sustainability and the architecture of global finance. How do we think about all of this? Um, how do we? And what do we mean in terms of immediate actions that can be taken? So Simon was very persuasive in his overview of there's so much happening in the world. There's so much that could be happening in the world. I want to get much more. Detailed and granular what is happening in the United States because there wasn't a whole lot of mention of US actors in that presentation. Uh, what's happening now, what may happen soon, what is lacking? We can see that the risks of climate are the risks, the, the issues that are better understood in the policy environment here. The, it's a little more questionable about the broader sustainability agenda and what that means. And I'll want to end, and I hope we can really get into a conversation about this, about how we think in terms of systems and systemic hazards, not just in terms of how do we, in regulatory or legislative fashion, deal with the specific separable risks that are already part of the conversation. So, this is a very timely session because we are about to have the advent of a new and very different US administration. Is this going to be another tipping point? Well, it's pretty clear that the incoming administration has a different set of priorities and is thinking very seriously about some parts of the broader sustainability agenda. One of the four top priorities is climate. Much of the focus around managing the pandemic, economic recovery, recovery, racial equity is again thinking about a what you could call a broader sustainability agenda. The US is still the most important of the financial sectors in the world, the most important actor in the global financial architecture. Um, so let me highlight a few points about what we might expect from the key actors within the new administration, now that we have a sense of who those people are likely to be. Um, I'll start with the Fed. You see it's building there and then talk a bit about the, the Treasury. So we get a bit of an overview of US policy. As Simon mentioned, the Federal Reserve Board, which is the US Central Bank, just applied to join the Central Bank Network on Greening the Financial System. So it's now going to be part of this global conversation among scores of central banks and regulators about how you transform the financial sector. They are not talking about changes. I'll talk later about how existing Fed authority to bring systemic hazards like climate change um, already exists. It already has statutory authority through legislation like Dodd-Frank. What is it thinking about right now? It's beginning to think very seriously about climate change. This is from the latest financial stability report that came out in November, um, just a few weeks ago. Yes, the, there are risks to the financial system, to the value of real or financial assets. The Fed is beginning to think about ways to deepen its understanding of the full scope of the implications of climate change, and it expects the banks that it regulates to be able to pay attention to those risks in ways that it ha they had not previously done. It seems to me that what this calls for 
is a kind of reaching across areas of expertise that is not what financial regulators have normally done. It requires a deeper understanding of a whole set of issues that haven't previously been part of their mandate. And we have to think about what kind of structures do they need in order to actually make this work. Uh, just to use their graphic about how they are thinking about taking just the climate part of the sustainability story and relating it to financial system vulnerabilities. They are beginning to think in systemic terms. They're talking about nonlinear effects and timing lags and all of the rest of it, which is an important development. We really need to see how far this goes. Thinking about the US Treasury, which has enormous influence across a whole range of parts of the American economy. Um, here I'm picking on Janet Yellen because she has been proposed as the new Treasury Secretary. So I want to give you a sense of what her background and thinking is, is currently leading her to be talking about, uh, and then talk a little bit about what else the Fed and Treasury can do. Janet Yellen with Mark Carney just released a report under the auspices of the G30 that was talking about mainstreaming the transition to a net zero economy. They talk a lot about the need for carbon pricing, the need for different kinds of regulation. Um, I think the most important part that I saw in that report is that they spend a lot of time thinking about how crucial it is to have credible long-term government policy commitment a very difficult thing to do under the US system. And the model that they were looking for is the model of central banks, which makes sense given that that's the model that they're familiar with. They're calling for the creation of independent carbon councils that would not be the decision makers in terms of what should the targets of sustainability policy be, but would have independent authority to take action in somewhat the same way that central banks do in order to prevent short-term politicization of, of a long-term agenda. And they point to the fact that the UK already has such a thing, France, Germany have bits of it. And they talk about the need for private companies to have transition plans. And as we just saw on the Fed slide, there's an expectation that private companies are going to have such plans and their riskiness will be evaluated in part on the credibility of those plans. So Yellen is clearly taking these kinds of issues quite seriously already, and she's also been very active talking about inequality and social stability. The Treasury is in a hugely influential position. The, it's it got the over, overall portfolio includes domestic tax and tax break, regulatory budget policies, all of which have sustainability implications. Um, she will be leading the Financial Stability Oversight Council, which was set up in the US after 2008 to identify the risks that can emerge from systemic shocks and coordinate financial regulation. Um, to the degree that we get more COVID stimulus, she will be in a position to influence how much more green rather than red on that chart that Simon showed the United States could do. There will be influence through the US membership of the multilateral financial institutions. We're re-engaging with Paris and with that whole set of, of discussions and we have all sorts of options for engaging in multi-stakeholder initiatives on climate, biodiversity, nature, oceans, et cetera, all of which Treasury will play a very important role in. So what we're seeing is an administration that is coming in with something of a different mindset from what we've seen over the last several years, how far this goes to reaching answers to Simon's very important question of, is this, just change, or is this actually reaching the level of transformation that so clearly is needed? I think we don't know. So my last point here is, what will they be able to do should they choose to go much farther? Well, we don't know how much federal legislation is possible because we still don't know the outcome of the US Senate races. So we're all waiting for January 5th in Georgia to see what happens with those two Senate races. But there's a lot going around in the circles that are interested in these questions about all the other ways in which a new administration could act quite strikingly without necessarily having to adopt new legislation. 
We already have the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act passed in 2010, um, which gives very broad macroprudential regulatory authority to um, partly, partly it's the Financial Stability Oversight Council, um, and partly it's to the Federal Reserve Board under Section 165, which allows them to craft enhanced prudential standards, which can take into account whatever it is that they can make a case needs to be part of prudential regulation. When we're looking at climate, when we're looking at ecosystem collapse, when we're looking at these big systemic hazards, there's nothing in that legislation that says it has to be focused on things like the 2008 mortgage crisis. There's at least the potential for a broader regulatory approach. I think it's also important to keep in mind that in the United States, a great deal of policy doesn't happen at the central level, although financial regulation does. There is a great deal going on at the state and local levels, in the private sector, in civil society, and in networks that engage them all. If you want to get a good sense of just what the U.S. is doing just on climate, Google America's Pledge, which is an ongoing series of reports about just how much is going on in the United States on climate progress, even in the absence of central government leadership. So, what, where does this leave us? Well, what we don't have that, James mentioned that I spent some time in Singapore, um, that I saw in Singapore and some other countries, is a capacity in the central government to try to pull all of these broad pieces together. Singapore has a Center for Strategic Futures located in the Prime Minister's office. I don't think the U.S. has anything quite like that, but I think we're going to see more and more governments looking for ways in which they pull together this very broad agenda, because you can't actually do finance unless you make it sustainable finance over the longer term. Sunil, thank you very much, and I'll leave it at that. And um, uh, thank you very much. Um, and I think that given what Anne has said, um, in terms of what will happen, not just in the United States, but in uh, um, around the world, will depend very much on how um, I think the private sector um, reacts uh, to the whole issue of uh, uh, climate change and biodiversity loss um, and climate volatility and so on and so forth. So over to you, Sonia, um, uh, for the next 10 minutes. Thank you very much, Sunil. And in, indeed, I have a, um, a bit of a hard act to follow here with uh, Simon and, and Anne. So thank you very much for those remarks. Um, I want to give a, a selection of sort of private sector views with a tilt toward a global perspective, because that's what we at the IIF do. Uh, we're an international association representing about 450 firms across all financial services, so banks, insurance companies, pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, asset managers, and so on. I want to point out, too, that over half our membership is from emerging markets, so we truly are global in our perspective, and that's what I'm going to try to, to share with you today. Um, so I want to say a few things. I want to follow on a little bit from what Anne was saying about the importance of the U.S. policy landscape in a global context and what some of the coming changes could mean in an international context. Second, on the role of central banks and supervisors, like the Network for Greening the Financial System, in the context of greening the financial system, what, what their role is and what they're doing. Third, around some of the key issues in financial regulation presently, disclosure, climate risk management, uh, stress testing scenarios, that, that type of thing. Say a few words about that. And finally, end up with a, a really important topic, which just doesn't get enough attention, which is uh, sovereign debt, sovereign debt markets, the massive rise in global debt over the past decade and uh, implications for sustainable development goals, natural capital, biodiversity, and so on, because those two are are inherently linked, unfortunately. <laughs> so just to start with the first of these topics, sort of the US in a global context, I wanted to follow on from what Anne was saying about the changing domestic picture by noting that you know the US is absolutely pivotal to the global sustainable finance policy agenda. If the US is absent from these discussions, and in many ways the past four years have 
have been that scenario, then what you end up with is a very fragmented approach to international climate and sustainability policy and regulation. And that's tremendously dangerous because if you think about it, if you're, if you're a global firm, say you're a, a, a global bank or a global asset manager, you're operating in multiple jurisdictions. You cannot operate effectively if the rules of the game are different everywhere you go. That's no way to scale the trillions that we need in funding for sustainable development goals. So a coherent international policy framework is going to absolutely rely on the U.S. being front and front and center, as it were, you know, uh, not in any sense sort of taking over, right? Because this has all been marching forward without the U.S. for, for some time now, but contributing a, a, a unique U.S. perspective and helping shape the global agenda such that it works across jurisdictions, including uh, here in the U.S. Um, uh, Anne had mentioned, you know, the, the change in tone, the new uh, thinking that's come in with the CFTC report. You're starting to see that percolate into different sectors of the U.S. financial regulatory apparatus into the, how the central bank thinks about climate risk as financial risk. And that's a really important thing to remember because until quite recently, you didn't have that clarity of thinking, right? So it was Mark Kearney, the famous Mr. Kearney, who has said climate risk is financial risk. So in some sense, we spent the last few years understanding how that works. You know, if you look at, for example, some of the work that the IMF has done, uh, in their global financial stability report and other publications on how how financial how climate risk translates to financial risk, and that's really sort of seminal work, and that's creeping into policy discussions around the world. Um, the same thing needs to happen for so natural capital, biodiversity, so these beyond climate risks. But I think we're some ways from from getting to there, and I'll explain why presently. Um, you know, the, the, the fact that the Biden administration has elevated climate change to one of its top priorities, put John Kerry as a climate czar, you know, that really does reflect growing public concern. And as Anne was saying, it remains to be seen how that's going to play out in the, the difficult uh, and very partisan environment here in, in Washington. But I think you're going to see much more progress in the next uh, four years. But I, I do think that the need for greater U.S. engagement is critical. And so this means the network for greening the financial system, but this also means the global standard setters. So the Financial Stability Board, the Bail Committee on Banking Supervision, the securities regulators, the insurance regulators. One very important piece of this is disclosure, you know, which sounds very, very straightforward, right? Oh, yeah, you just report your 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 climate and environmental related risks and you know be done with it but I'll get as I'll get to in a minute it's really not that simple um so the second uh topic I wanted to cover was you know the network for greening the financial systems and central banks and supervisors more broadly how the private sector sees their role in sustainability so I think there's there's a few ways to think about this one very important point is that central banks need to sort of green their own portfolios, make them uh, their reserve management accounts, make them environmentally sustainable um, and supportive of these broader goals. And that's one, one important piece of it. But in terms of financial sector regulation and supervision, we've, we've had three broad approaches. Uh, one is resilience, and this is very traditional classic central bank territory. So to ensure the safety and soundness of individual financial institutions, both short run and long run, given the risks, the transition and physical climate risks. So this is kind of a micro prudential lens on it. And you'll note that I, I would just do a little detour here to say that in, in central bank thinking, with, with a very few exceptions, this is really all focusing on climate risk now. So there's a lot to do in terms of incorporating beyond climate, environmental, natural capital, biodiversity risks into this lens. So one is resilience, safety and soundness of individual firms. The next is, is more ambitious perhaps, and you'd say that central banks could have a responsibility for alignment. So they look at the alignment of the financial system with decarbonization objectives for the economy to understand and assess and maybe take action 
to reduce the potential for future financial instability that comes from climate and environmental risk. So how well is the financial system as a whole aligned with climate imperatives and risks? That's a macro prudential lens. And finally, and this is a little more controversial, uh, active transition. Should central banks be using prudential or supervisory tools to regulate and incentivize the financial system to support the broader economic transition to a low carbon economy? by the provision and pricing of financial products and services. So that's a very active role for central banks. And I think it's pretty straightforward and not controversial to say that that approach, that lens on the role of central banks and supervisors is much more of a European lens than it is a US lens. And I think you, when you, when you speak to the US financial community, to the US financial regulatory uh, agencies, you know, there, there's, I think, some white space between the idea that you know the financial sector should be an instrument of of, of accurate of active transition so this all plays it back into the u.s role in all of this because if we don't get these tensions sorted out then i think we'll have a very difficult time in formulating a coherent uh, financial policy so there's disagreement on approach um th i then wanted to to just say a few words about um some of the, the nitty gritty of all of this, the, the hot button issues in sustainable finance uh, regula regulation and supervision. So I'd put these into a few buckets, uh, disclosure, stress testing, risk pricing, scenario analysis, all, all of this. And I wanted to start with disclosure because it is so very basic and fundamental. You got to have this. It's kind of like a multi-stage problem for this. You need to bottom line is you need good disclosure. But what do you need to get there? You need to have the right data. You need decision useful data, like the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures will set out for you. What does that mean? It's one little word, but it has a big punch. You gotta have information on environmental factors like carbon emissions or shifts to renewables, flood risk, biodiversity. You need data information about how all this is transpiring. You need to be able to measure your own carbon footprint if you're a firm. Uh, you need social data, like human capital, labor standards, diversity, migration, you need information, data, data points. You need governance data, ESG, board composition, corporate ethics, shareholder rights, and so on. So you've got a, a, a fundamental issue. So you need data providers like Bloomberg or Standard & Poor's, Moody's need to source the data and find a way to make it comparable so it's usable. Companies like Amazon or General Motors need to be able to access and measure the data and be able to report it. Investors need comparable and standardized disclosure to inform their asset allocation and investment decisions, ultimately do their own reporting. And supervisors and regulators need this information, comprehensive and accurate disclosure for the macro and micro prudential oversight that we were just talking about. So there are many, many stakeholders in good disclosure, which is why there's such a tussle between voluntary where it is now voluntary this type of disclosure is, is is voluntary but in many jurisdictions notably in europe but beyond are moving more toward a mandatory disclosure approach uh, which may be some ways off for for, for the us so again there's a divergence in approach there uh, on scenarios and stress testing i think this is a a, a real uh, hot button issue the point the key point to remember here is that you know everyone all the stakeholders, regulators, supervisors, industry, academia, you know, NGOs, even the United Nations, you know, are all at early stages in their ability to conduct climate risk assessment and scenario analysis. And obviously natural capital risk assessment, biodiversity risk assessment, all of that. It's all very early stage. There's been some good progress made, but we have data and data quality gaps and operational challenges, chief among which is this methodology is really complex. I mean, we we at the IIF are running webinars, workshops, podcasts, individual training sessions to try to help our many members move up this learning curve on, on the methodology you need to, to do this risk assessment. It's also very forward looking. We don't have a lot of historical data. How, those of you who do risk modeling know that you base it on historical experience. We don't have a lot of historical experience here. That is really difficult 
And the forward looking nature of this analysis means you got to look out 10, 15, 20, 30 years. It's extremely challenging to do. So all of that makes this kind of scenario analysis very uh, complex and challenging. And then you have the whole question of how you translate that scenario analysis into things like a, a bank stress test. And this is where I think you have a lot of pushback from industry and in saying, how can you run a classic stress test on us when a stress test typically will cover, what, nine quarters or something? How can you be stress testing us on, on such significant unknowns when we have these kind of data gaps and lack of mandatory disclosure so we don't even have the information we need to, to produce these? So I want to stress that it's not an unwillingness to do this. I mean, everybody wants to make these disclosures. What I'm saying is that we're still at early stages in, in, in our knowledge base and how we go about it. So one of the things we, we are strongly recommending is that industry and regulators, supervisors pool information and knowledge and work together on the best design for scenario analysis, which ultimately feeds into stress testing and any potential changes in the prudential framework, like you know capital requirements. If you want to incentivize some types of green funding and disincentivize brown funding, you know, you've got to have this toolkit in place. So the last thing I'll cover, and I'll be brief here, I know we're we're getting up there on time, is this kind of sovereign debt question. And I just frame it by saying, you know, this is literally, this, these past 10 years have been the fourth great debt wave, starting back in the early 1980s with Latin America. In the 1990s, you remember the Asian crisis, the Russian crisis, you had subprime mortgages in the 2000s, and now in this era of nonstop low and negative rates, you have tremendous debt pileup. Um, and there's sort of three big types of risks here. Um, you've got, a, and, and, and COVID has obviously made this worse, because if you think about a debt to GDP ratio, you have much higher borrowing because everybody's doing pandemic response, and you have a much lower denominator because you know economies are in recession and GDP is, is, is declining. So you've got climbing debt ratios in mature markets, an important source of, of funding for sustainable development goals comes from, from mature markets and they're constrained by their own balance sheets. You have higher debt in emerging markets, especially in the corporate sector. And then, you know, worst of all, and Simon alluded to this earlier, you've got climate vulnerable low income countries where debt sustainability is really coming into question for many of these countries. Their tourism revenues are hit, their remittances are hit, their exports are hit, you know, all at the same time. And then, you know, if you're juggling how to service your debt and feed your population, something's got to give, you know, so there are all kinds of global initiatives like the G20 Debt Service Suspension Initiative to try to address this problem. I think one one problem with all, with all of this and with managing debt generally and debt restructuring is that uh, sustainability goals can get left by the wayside, which is why we think there's a lot of room for innovation and solutions, some of which was Simon was referring to, to support liability management, to help bring in new new money, bring in positive net capital flows to these economies that need them so much whether that's short-term solutions or recovery-oriented solutions. Um, one particular category that, that is interesting, and then I'll stop here, uh, is solutions that promote sustainable development goals. These include sort of public-private partnerships to promote the SDGs, things like blended finance for sustainable infrastructure, development of SDG-linked bond markets. I mean, this is a huge, huge growth area, way beyond green bonds. Um, but it includes sort of credit enhanced bond funds, partial guarantees, you know, so working hand in hand, public and private sector. And importantly, areas like debt for nature, debt for climate swaps, you know, all of these, these tools can be tremendously useful if we can scale them up. And finally, integration of ESG factors is happening rapidly, and particularly with, with respect to emerging market debt financing, but also you know, global sovereign debt markets more, more broadly. And that's a, a re really key growth area to watch. So I'll stop there, Sunil. Thank you very much, uh, Sonia, for providing a private sector perspective.
Um, let me start with um, one question, which I think is in some sense fundamental to thinking of climate risk as systemic risk, is that even the scientific consensus is evolving. Um, the issue is we're never going to have enough information, so to speak, uh, to take preemptive actions. And so the, so, so the question that arises is that um, what do we need to do now, um, here and now, in terms of data and analytics um, to increase the size of the um, sustainable finance market and, in some sense, decrease the the cynicism that is out there that a lot of this is is is, is talk but not much is getting accomplished on the ground um so um, simon you and Anne and um, sonia you can respond to that and then we'll open up the questions simon you gonna start i can yeah so so um just so uh uh we don't agree on everything because that always gets a bit um, kind of uh, low. I, 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 I think that um, in the more complex area of nature and biodiversity, despite shortages of data, it would be possible for commercial banks, perhaps less so uh, in the capital markets, certainly DFIs, development finance institutions, to now commit to um, nature stress tests across their balance sheet and disclosure, accepting that there are data weaknesses and so on. And I, I think it would be um, productive for the banking community to move on that commitment now. I was reading today yet another sort of public campaigning report this time from Global Witness um, highlighting the role of key banks in financing land use that was leading to deforestation uh, in Brazil. Um, and putting aside whether it's true or not, that the reality is, is that the banks could go a lot further today in highlighting what they're doing uh, even with available data, and that would make these public debates more effective. Uh, so there's always room for better data, um, but to your point, Sunil, you know we have to we we have to operate and communicate and report and analyze in the context of continued uncertainty and data shortages. And if I can just build a little bit on. Um... I can't think of an issue area where we aren't constantly dealing with inadequate data and serious data shortages. When we start trying to bring in environmental sustainability and related factors, we've quite deliberately avoided knowing. We, we haven't put anywhere near the kind of funding into gathering the data that would be relevant on a global basis that we should. We've put huge amounts of money into doing things that simply took nature completely for granted. And quite clearly, we don't, we cannot wait to take policy responses or for the private sector to take its own responses to the threats that we know are looming over us because we don't have detailed data on exactly what to do. We can certainly have a sense of direction and a very strong sense of direction long before we get that kind of detailed data. No, and I, and I didn't mean to imply that the lack of these tools is a basis, is a reason, rationale for no action. That that's not the case at all. What what? And I I would just simply give a one word answer to the, to Sunil's question, which is alignment, right? I mean, the thing is, there are so many different rules in so many different jurisdictions. There is not a global governance structure that will say global financial sector do this. No. The U.S. tells its financial system what to do. You know, Europe says what their financial systems should do and so on and so forth. So what we're what we're strongly advocating is that these policies be aligned and also be consistent with macroeconomic policy, right? So that you don't have, say, a, just to give an example, you have a push for greater funding for sustainable infrastructure, let's just say. At the same time, you have a, a regulatory structure that you know penalizes that kind of, of financing as it's too as it's risky, right? So these these systems 
greater alignment is needed and also on the risk measurement tools. We can't all be using different definitions of sustainable this, that, or the other, or sustainable or responsible investment and be able to scale up. There has to be greater alignment. Not By no means am I saying that we, we shouldn't take action. We should just go about it in the right way. And, and I completely agree, Sonia. Um, I, I think we have to continually push for standardization. I, I totally agree. And IAF obviously has been doing that in the green finance banking interface um, consistently. I, mean, I think the, the fundamental point I was trying to get to is that I don't think, uh, given the nature of climate risks, given the nature of biodiversity risks, that we are ever going to be looking at risks per se. This is going to be fundamentally uncertain. Uh, 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 I mean, 19 uncertainty that we'll be, we'll be facing. Um, and the issue then becomes, um, if we're going to be uncertain moving forward, um, what kind of role, what kind of norms do we envisage, say, from both um, the private sector and the government sector? You know, what roles should um, asset managers like BlackRock play in um, uh, moving this agenda forward? What roles should banks play? What, how should the, uh, the governments behave in, in, in trying to push, push this agenda? Because it, it, we're never going to have enough data, as, as all three of you have pointed out. Um, so let's start with Simon. So, so I'm going to make a prediction, and I'm not sure if it's really a prediction or a wish. Yeah, if a country, and I'll take the UK as an example, not only passes a policy, but puts into law a commitment to a zero carbon balance at a national level by 2050, I think we will quickly now come to a stage where the regulator is challenged, particularly on the financial regulatory side, to ensure that licensed financial institutions can demonstrate that they will be aligned to that law. Yeah, and that doesn't mean you're not allowed to do coal or you are allowed to do that, but it's about showing a pathway to deliver against that agreed priority. Now, there will be significant regulatory arbitrage problems because clearly some financial institutions will just go, well, then we don't have to be in London, we can be in the Cayman Islands or wherever it happens to be. Um, but I think there is going to be a next stage where a policy alignment or coherence between what's happening in parliaments or Congress and the rule of law has to be reflected more fully in how financial regulators demand different results from the organizations that they license. And I think we will see central banks in court in the same way that we have seen country governments in court over these issues. And I think that is a healthy and necessary next step, even although it's clearly more aggressive than, you know, voluntary folks doing voluntary things. Sorry, did you want to respond to that? Yeah, Please. well, let me just uh, add briefly to, to what Simon uh, was saying by, by noting that the role of, you know, the question is about role of entities like BlackRock, and I would broaden this to, to financial firms more broadly, it has to be to sort of lead by example to set out the, the sound principles for, for sustainable development and the financing of these principles, but it's also to bring along the, the rest of the world that is brown, right? So it isn't just a matter of saying, I am only going to fund you know, solar technology or wind farms or what have you, but how do you bring along heavy industry? How do you, you know, support the kind of financing that, that greens the brown, as it were. So that's also important to, to, to consider. Could I um, follow up on that and, and actually pose a question to Sonia and, and to Simon? We're talking about complex systems. We know that about change in complex systems is you look at the agents that make up that system and you look at the norms and incentives that govern their behavior and change those. You know, the, the usual norm that seems to govern the behavior in the financial sector is bonuses and income and you know it's it's all about finance. What does it take to have the right set of norms and incentive structures within the private sector in finance? What what would you change? I'm thinking of in, in the real economy, there are companies that have 
support half their bonuses on the basis of sustainability targets. Is anything like that happening in finance? I think the, the, the need for greater transparency around governance issues is, is very clear here. Uh, I do think that there is far more discussion, for example, at our own board of directors, right? And I've been speaking to the board now for, for many, many years. And the level of discussion on this particular issue has really accelerated in the past, say, two to three years. So I think you are going to see much more attention paid to this, uh, particularly uh, as governance becomes more and more part of the conversation. Um. I know, Sonia, you have to leave um, since you have a hard constraint. Um, thanks very much for making time for us. Um, and um, I'll, I'll, I'll continue the discussion uh, a little bit more with Simon and Anne, because uh, I have some more questions coming in. Uh, but if you have to run, um, thank you so much for, for making the time for us. Um, I'm so it, sorry. It, 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 it's it's like on Zoom, right? I do apologize. <laughs> but it's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks, thanks. so much for, for, for joining us. So um, we have um, a few more minutes for um, a, a few more questions. Um, so the issue is that we understand that the process going forward is going to be uncertain. That the question is, um, how do we push the transition along? Right? We we keep talking about stranded assets. We keep talking about uh, tipping points um, and, and and so on and so forth. And as Anne raised, questions of incentives. Um, the question is, what is the best way? to produce that realignment in transition um, to move uh, not just the financial sector, but uh, uh, the broader production system, as well as our consumption patterns in, in, in a particular direction. So, so, yeah, so, so let me try and respond to that, um, perhaps picking also up on sort of Anne's complexity question. Um, so, you know, you, you, you can't make Tesla cars in 19th century factories. Yeah, just the, the nature of the building makes it impossible. Forget the equipment, just the building makes it impossible. Yeah, and similarly, you can't address 21st century challenges using 20th century governance models. It just doesn't work. Yeah, and so there may well have been good cause you know, from the 60s through to the end of the last century to create highly specialized vertical governance models. You know, this is a subject that Anne can speak to far better than I can, you know, where central banks do this, but they don't touch that. You know, policymakers do this, but they don't touch that. Yeah, and they sort of chat in the corridors, but there's this thing that says my mandate is an inflation target you know, although we are heading for four degrees, have a nice day. Yeah, that clearly is at a level of cognitive, behavioral and institutional dysfunction that we need to call out. However, humans, you know, incessantly try to use old systems to do new things. Yeah, particularly in the corporate community, but also in government. So at some point, we will run out of tactical opportunities to make change. Yes, we need to do metrics. Yes, we need new standards. Yes, we need stress testing models. Yes, we need more disclosure. All of these sort of efficient market moves are all to be welcomed. And at Finance for Biodiversity and elsewhere, we're involved in all of them, or many of them. But actually, they won't add up to the changes that are needed. We're still heading for the wall at 100 miles an hour, we've just gone from fifth gear down to fourth gear, and we're still not turning the wheel. We will need central banks and policymakers to align what they do in new and difficult ways, because it challenges us institutionally and in other ways. We will need to consider reinterpretations of fiduciary responsibility of pension funds. We will need to think beyond Anglo-Saxon models of exclusive and dedicated focus on the interests of financial shareholders. You know, we will need to radically innovate in the governance and innovation space if we want our grandchildren to survive. And actually the joke is, but it's not really a joke, is that we know that. We really know that. We're still trying to squeeze the last bit of life out of the old system, but we know that the level of changes will not come through funky technology and you know, better Anglo-Saxon capitalism. 
Uh, um, I think we've run out of time, um, and I think we've covered a lot of ground, um, and we can, I think, um, have other um, uh, uh, webinars on digging into specific aspects of what we've discussed today. Uh, but yeah, I, I think um, Simon put it out uh, very um, eloquently in his last response, and would you want to add something uh, before we um, end? Just in one sentence, or two sentences, it sounds like a radical agenda when you lay it out the way you did. In fact, it is becoming increasingly apparent that it is a call for a radical response to a radical conditions, not something that I think is even questionable anymore. So I absolutely agree with you. So, um, I, I'm, and, and let me end by saying that when I talked to my scientists' friends, they said, we have not uh, 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 dreamt up the climate crisis or uh, uh, species extinction. And I think it's very, very important that we understand the science, because as I said earlier, um, understanding the science is very important, and that is going to uh, lead us how we should be responding, how quickly we should be responding. Because, I mean, we can talk about uncertainty, we can talk about risk, um, but the question is we fundamentally have to understand uh, how the physical world around, around us has changed, is changing, and likely to change if we keep not doing what we should be doing. Yes. But anyway, with that, I think thank you very much, uh, uh, Simon, um, for uh, a scintillating discussion. And thank you very much to um, Anne and Sonia for making time uh, for the webinar too. And thank you, of course, uh, for everyone for sending in your questions and for joining us for this, uh, uh, for this event. Thank you.